The next matter to come before the court this morning is G. N. Angels et al. versus Thomas A. Naiman et al. Both sides will have 15 minutes to argue. The appellant may reserve up to five minutes for rebuttal. If you're the appellant and wish to reserve some time, if you'd let me know when you get started, I'm keeping the clock and you keep your prize in the passage of time. We have read the briefs. John Porter for uh, appellants. Um, I only am requesting two minutes. Uh, we're requesting five minutes for a rebuttal. Uh, Mr. Happ will handle uh, the argument after me, and I believe Mr. Haddon would take care of the uh, rebuttal. Okay. Just so the court's clear. Thank you. On the appellant side, we are going to be hearing from counsel for G and Angels, correct? Yes. Okay. And you are going to commence that. I, I just want to make sure we have one person getting up for rebuttal. Is yes. it your understanding? Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. I was confused by the recitation. Okay. And, and for rebuttal, you wish five, to reserve five minutes to do that. What? Okay. I just Whatever. want to make sure everybody knows how things are. Thank you so much. I apologize, uh, counsel. I just want to make sure I had it correctly. Sure. You may continue. Thank you. Uh, I represent uh, the Naaman family, five members of the Naaman family, uh, who are being sued individually, you know, along with the, their uh, corporate interests. They're being sued by their one sibling, Thomas Naaman, who believes that he is entitled to have his minority interest in uh, family corporations bought out. There are two other siblings who derive absolutely no benefit from these corporations. They have their own jobs, live elsewhere. They're, they're not requesting to be bought out. So that is uh, the big picture. I point out that uh, Attorney Happ who received the subpoena in this case, he received, well, he, he started this case. He filed the uh, original complaint, which was a fairly simple case of partition of a partnership. Um, he remained as a witness on the, uh, on the counterclaims uh, because we thought he would be a witness. I know, uh, I'm sorry, he got off of the case because we thought he would be a witness off of the main, the, the case that has developed into the main case. However, we have determined that we can cover that issue that he was going to cover with other evidence, so he is, he is no longer a witness. However, the point being that he did prepare a lot of work product for my clients when he was the original attorney, and for me, uh, when I took over the case, he did a lot of work product. I believe the court's last case decision in this area, it might be McDade versus State Farm, I would point out that in that case, uh, State Farm did not request a hearing on privileged uh, material. But we haven't even got the privilege, right? Yes, it's been raised. According to the Cleveland Clinic, it has been raised. But the point is, we haven't gotten to the actual what is privileged or not privileged. way to determine what is privileged and not privileged is to have a hearing. There's cases that say that even producing a log is a unfair advantage. What if there's numerous experts and the other side can figure out how many experts you have? Well, the point is, um, the discovery matter is immediately I'm not saying this necessarily applies here, I'm just trying to figure it all out, is how can we even 
what is privileged and what is not. That's why a <coughs> hearing is so important that it can be determined what is what is uh, attorney client privilege, what is work privilege, what is opinion work privilege, what is fact work privilege. Uh, what if uh, this was a tire case and someone was suing uh, Goodyear Tire over a defective tire and Buckingham Doolittle for the last 20 years had handled all their tire cases. Uh, and all of a sudden Buckingham Doolittle gets a, a, a motion, uh, a subpoena to produce all, all of their records from all of those prior cases. Uh, that's burdensome. But that's and, and it has to, had, by, by definition, 20 years, that has to include privilege material. But, but I guess my point is, that's a different issue, isn't it? And that is whether something is unduly burdensome as opposed to whether or not it's privilege. Because I think, I think, maybe I'm wrong, but I thought we were at the stage here that we're talking about whether it's unduly burdensome. I understand one of the arguments is about the hearing. But I thought the whole point here is that it's unduly burdensome to even try to prepare a privilege log or to you know, to try to gather up all those documents after all those, up all those years. That is correct. And uh, Section 4, well, yes, that's, that's exactly our, our point. Mm -hmm. And so why is that appealable? That's what I'm getting at. If we're not talking about, if we haven't gotten to the point of privilege, I, what you're, I think what you're saying is um, that that McDade case said that even uh, a motion to quash is appealable. State, has recently stated that merely raising uh, privilege allows um, allows for an appeal and, and automatically grants jurisdiction. And uh, I think I think in this case, Attorney Half has uh, raised uh, not not just a Cleveland Clinic referred to just a plausible raising of the issue. I think he has. Definitely pointed out why there is a, a problem. Thank you, Judge Allen. Um, I apologize. This is just something, you know, I, I have a lot of these issues, uh, and now Judge Hensel will be handling them as presiding judge. So um, these issues come up quite a bit, and we have to, you know, these are very important to the court, so we're trying to really figure it out. So I, well, it's a circle. You can't ignore the burdens. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Gregory Hap, the, the subject of the subpoena. <clears throat> the first I would raise to the court in response to that is that Civil Rule 45C5 specifically talks about privilege and other protected matters. The Supreme Court in the decision of the major decision they just came down with, with the uh, Cleveland Clinic, mm -hmm. really goes to great lengths talking about the attorney-client relation of uh, privilege and the attorney-client work product. And they consider attorney work product a doctrine and not necessarily a privilege. And that's specifically true. The, the dissent in that case pointed out that the court was branching off, declaring one a privilege and the other a doctrine. <clears throat> in this case, the court has only allowed an in-camera inspection of privileged matters, not other protected matters. The other protected matters in this case are the ongoing litigation that I prepared in the original thing that they want to view. They want have subpoenaed all my records for G and Angels for quality. That's that 45C. 45C and the adoption of 45C5 went beyond just privilege. It says that you will protect. But I believe in McDade, this court decided, if you look at the decision of the trial court that was reviewed, the court went beyond and said that they did not have to produce privilege or protected matters. And I believe that's important. But, but in the McDade decision, we don't really talk about why the motion to quash was a beauty appeal. Yes. Denial of the motion. Why it was not immediately appealable. Why it was immediately appealable. <clears throat> I understand that. In this case, there's a big significant difference. It was never raised in that case 
the, there was never an invocation of the jurisdiction of the court on this subpoena. That is a major difference in that case and in this case. They never filed a return. The only way you can invoke the jurisdiction of the court on a subpoena is to file the return and file that subpoena with the court. They did not do that. They have never filed a return under oath in this case. The other thing that we raise is that they never tendered a witness fee. And there are cases that hold, if you do not tender a witness fee, that it is an invalid subpoena. Their argument is, because I live in Medina County and practice in Medina County, and the case is in Medina County, they can subpoena me anywhere in Ohio without having to give me a witness fee in mileage. Their argument is that just because I want you to come to Cleveland, I don't have to afford you any, any rights. The undue burden that I think that this court has to look at, and there are numerous decisions by other, by this court and others where they've reviewed cases under undue burden or simply a motion to quash to a third party. The big differentiation in the case involving the Cleveland Clinic, that didn't involve a non-party. This involves a non-party. I am a non-party to this lawsuit. The important fact is the burden that you're imposing, 45 is to protect, everything through 45 is to protect the non-party. If we open that door that you can just go subpoena anything that you want, any and all files of an attorney, you're really violating the basic fundamental trust that goes between an attorney and his client for confidential material, not just privilege, but confidential work product, confidential material. I can perceive numerous occasions where a client will hand me confidential material that is not necessarily subject to a privilege, but is confidential. I've been ordered to turn over my complete files, all my files for 16 years involving these companies and the estate. And I want to make sure that we save rebuttal time. Yes, and you are just now approaching into that rebuttal time. Okay, then I will reserve the rebuttal time. Thank you. Good morning, please, the court. My name is Greg O'Brien. I represent the appellee and defendant in the case, Thomas Naiman. As the court is, I'm sure, well aware, this court has an obligation under the Constitution of the state to restrict the cases that it reviews to those over which it has jurisdiction. And in this particular case, the orders, the two orders of the lower court, one commanding attorney half to produce non-privileged materials and declining his request for findings that it make findings of fact and conclusions of law are not final appealable orders under RC 2505.02 and do not qualify under any of the multiple subparts that define final orders under that statute. And therefore, neither of those orders is a final appealable order and this court does not therefore have jurisdiction to hear this appeal. For that reason, I ask the court to dismiss this appeal and return it to the trial court so that these proceedings can move along and get this case closer to a resolution. I don't think it's really disputed that this order does not involve attorney-client privileged materials. Most of the back and forth between the parties as they were in the pre-motion stage was devoted to Mr. Haps. And if you read the letters that are attached to the underlying motions, my partner wrote many of them and Mr. Haps wrote the others. And counsel, I apologize I didn't stop you sooner, but back to the jurisdiction issue. How is this case different than McVeigh versus State Farm on that particular issue? On the issue of whether or not a privileged issue is right on point and only privileged discovery is immediately appealable and that's what this court held on one part of its holding. I think maybe your question is directed more towards 
the motion to quash and the, the substantial, and whether or not uh, discovery is burdensome. To a third party. Yeah. That issue, the, for whatever reason, the court declined or, or maybe <coughs> neglected, I don't know, uh, to address the issue. It's simply uh, not addressed. The court simply chose to address the merits of the uh, burdensome issue in that case without first doing a jurisdictional analysis. Um, my uh, contention, well, I'm sorry, go ahead. Right, so, but if the court chose to do that, then is it not assumed that the, we found that we had jurisdiction? Otherwise, it wouldn't have proceeded to the... Well, to the if that's the case, um, you know, I can't, I can't uh, give any commentary on what the court's uh, analysis was if it withheld it from its opinion. Um, I suspect that maybe it was the it was the the opposite, but I don't. I, again, I wasn't on the court. I don't know you. Maybe you were. Um, I would only point you that there are no other similar cases in the state of Ohio where uh, a, an alleged uh, excessive burden or undue expense in complying with discovery has been held uh, to be a, a basis for a final appealable order under 2505.02. I can direct you to at least one case that specifically does address that exact issue and holds the other way, and that's the Fredericks versus uh, Good Samaritan Hospital case, which I think is the second district case. And in that particular case, uh, the court went through uh, with facts uh, extremely similar to this. The only the difference was that the uh, witness who was uh, ordered to co comply with the subpoena was a uh, physician who was planning to testify in the case as an expert witness for one of the parties. Um, here it's uh, an attorney who has not only uh, been identified as a witness, but it also was the person who filed the complaint, has represented every party in the case, including my client and his wife, um, and he has, uh, has intricately involved in all the underlying transactions involving these companies that are the subject of the uh, underlying dispute. Um, in the Fredericks case, uh, the court held that uh, that, that in order um, or that a right under Civil Rule 45C uh, requiring um, uh, a, a, uh, you know, the burdensome and the expense issues do not create substantial rights as that term is defined in 2505.02A1. Um, then went on to also find that uh, that there was no that in order similar to this in a provisional remedy is not a provisional remedy, um, and that it would, in any event, uh, that there is a meaningful opportunity for appeal at the end of the case. Um, what the court basically said is that if, if privilege is not involved, then a subpoena to a third party is just like any other discovery dispute. Um, and if you're not, with the, the, the protection that we afford in the provisional remedy portion of the statute is because of the unique situation uh, that we have when privileged material is, is being invoked, and that you can't unring that bell. If it's a matter of, well, I had to produce uh, you know, a, a box of documents that I really shouldn't have had to produce, well, Civil Rule uh, 45 provides a remedy there. Uh, there's a, a C1 uh, states that no attorney can you know, uh, use unreasonable measures to force somebody else to, do, to uh, produce documents and testimony and so forth. And uh, at the end of the appeal, if, the, per if the, uh, the, the person opposing the discovery is vindicated, they have a right under the sanctions section of uh, Rule 45 uh, that would allow them to recover whatever costs uh, they incurred in being forced to um, you know, un 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 wrongfully uh, answer, answer a subpoena. And that's just the same as it would be with anybody else in any other situation involving uh, routine discovery. The, the balancing that goes on here is that uh, the, the court system has to, we, the, the bigger picture is this underlying case has to proceed from where it's now stuck uh, with these various companies and these siblings and everybody else with their rights all up in the air while we litigate this really a, a clearly non-final order. And in the meantime, the trial judges put a stay on the case, justice has come grinding to a halt, and in my client in particular, is, is caught there, and, and that's not what the, what the civil rules are about. That's not what uh, 25052 uh, is about. We need, the, the right decision in this case is to say this does not involve privilege, it's not a final order, it needs to be dismissed, and we need to get the underlying case moving again so that we can have justice for all these parties.
And, with, and, and let me just, as a final uh, matter, in the event that the court uh, would uh, accept the proposition uh, that um, a burdensomeness uh, on a, a non-party uh, is a legitimate uh, basis for a final order, I would only point out that on the, on the substance of the appeal, then, uh, we, would, we should still win. It's a, it's a, um, uh, the, the, uh, the test is abuse of, of uh, discretion. Uh, clearly, there's a totally insufficient record uh, to support an abuse of discretion by the trial court in ordering the production of, this, of these documents. Uh, the implication has been in the appellate briefs that there is some mountain of material out there but there is no evidence in the trial court, it's part of this record, uh, indicating how many pages of documents Mr. Hat claims are involved, uh, what it would cost for him to comply with the subpoena, um, how long it would take him, uh, what outside resources he might have to employ to do that. That's all been implied in the, uh, in the appellate briefs, okay, that, there's, that this is a very onerous uh, condition, but no effort was made in the court below uh, to make that case, uh, to put it in a position where the trial judge could even reasonably consider uh, relief under uh, Civil Rule 45C to uh, B, I think it is, uh, in order some sort of uh, you know a, a cost to be apportioned or set aside. The, the record is just simply incomplete on that. And even if the court wanted to address the merits of, the, of this appeal, um, I think it, it would be uh, constrained to, to rule in our favor because there was clearly no abuse of discretion given the record that the trial court uh, had in front of it. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. You have uh, four and a half minutes. Okay. I'm sure you'll advise me when I get to that issue. Uh, again, I'm Bruce Head, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. What the, the conduct of, of the court below in, in issuing an order requiring the production of documents without acknowledging or granting the hearing that had been requested to discuss what documents should or should not be produced has created what amounts to a mess. Uh, Mr. Happ, of course, is a lawyer. He has a professional obligation to maintain privileged communications and also work product matters, as well as just various other items that come to his attention. He is not privileged just to divulge all this information because it's easier, cheaper, and more expedient for him to go ahead and give people in a family fight acts one side access to to all of these materials, uh, whether privileged or work product, or maybe not privileged, but not relevant. And the problem that the court created by not having a hearing was that we never got down to what issues should be subject to discovery. So what he has ordered is a mass of materials. If we were to file a privilege log, it would be hundreds of pages long. That's just not a fair burden. If the court had held a hearing and we had been given the opportunity to object and, and say, we don't know specific, we know some of what they're looking for, but their subpoena covered everything. It, the subpoena required the production of all files that related to all family members, regardless of any relevance to any remaining issue. And that is the huge problem with which we are faced. Because we either produce the documents, ignoring the professional obligation not to provide privileged information, or we file a massive privilege log, which would, would take, it would take two or three weeks to go through all of these documents. Well, one of, one of these files is like, I forget, eight you know, file boxes full of materials. And One is, all file. That, is all that in the record? In the we court. were not permitted to make a record, Your Honor, because... Nothing in the, the motion to quash? 
because when we, we I'm request... I'm sorry I interrupted you. I'm, I'm sorry, sorry I interrupted you. Go ahead. No, I'm just trying to say, try to answer your question. But we, it, it is, it, all of the detail is not in the record because we requested a hearing, and rather than have a hearing, uh, the court, after, after Dick Marcus had you know, referred the case back, uh, uh, they just, uh, the court had a, a short telephone conference with two counsel. Uh, Greg and I were not involved. And in that telephone conference, he said that you know, he was going to order production of the documents. Period. That was it. And then he added, you could, you could put on a privilege law. Uh, but but it, it's, it's that issue, you know, that issue. If they had issued an order like in McDade, where it said you don't need to produce non-privileged or privileged information or work product, if, if that order had gone on, uh, we would have had something with which we could deal. We still have a lot of things to argue about. Uh, but that is the problem, and that's why we're here. Uh, Greg has a, uh, he's got a dilemma. He can either produce all these documents and frankly subject himself to disciplinary misconduct. Or, you know, he can, he can be held in contempt or whatever else, I guess. But, but that is the problem and that's the reason we want to have an appeal now. If we had a hearing and we had an opportunity to present the evidence, then we would have that evidence to bring forth. And, and, and that, is, that is our, our primary problem. It's not only producing thousands of pages of documents, uh, but there's also a requirement to produce a floppy disk for all materials that, that are, you know, on a computer. So is it your contention then that you need more specificity as to exactly what it is they're looking for, or that they're on a fishing expedition, they just want everything you've got just to see what's well, I think, A, it's a fishing expedition. We know there's some information about gold coins that were apparently purchased. We, we know that's an issue, and, and that's the reason we made a late disclosure uh, from the uh, decision of probate court uh, where they opened a safety deposit box and there was a determination there was no gold coins in it. So that's the reason we put the, the two cases in and, and, and the gold coin argument. And um, I allowed you to address the question before the court, um, but you have reached the end of your allotted time. So. Okay. Thank I you appreciate all. it, and I thank you. I realize the course for running late, so we appreciate your patience. Thank you so much. Thank you. We will take the matter under advisement, issue a written decision to all sides, as well as post the decision on the our website, which can be linked to also through the Haskins website. Thank you. Thank you.